2 Samuel chapter 2, and uh, we will begin at verse 1. The plan is to do the whole chapter, because much of it is, um, I say simply, it's not simply, but it is um, historical record. The point of it is in the story rather than in the small detail. So we should be able to cover quite a bit of ground today, which is just as well since we start are starting uh, late. Let's <coughs> excuse me. Uh, let's open with uh, prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have graciously again gathered us together to hear and study your word, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us in all our meditation on your word and our stu- in our study that we would grow in our understanding be strengthened in faith and that you would rekindle in our hearts a true love for you and for our neighbors which we ask in jesus name amen, amen. amen. very good so 2 samuel uh, chapter one <coughs> what has happened so far is uh, that uh, uh, god has died the news has uh, reached uh, David, the uh, death of Saul, and especially his uh, dear friend, Jonathan. And now, please read the first, <coughs> excuse me, seven verses. Thank you. First seven. One to seven. After this, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, to which shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. So David went up there with his two wives also, Ahinoam of of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David brought up his men who were with him, every one with his household. And they dwelt in the towns of Hebron. <laughs> and the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When they told David, it was the men of Jabesh, Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed by the Lord, because you showed this loyalty to Saul your Lord and buried him. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Thank you. Can you just, sir, I I wasn't paying enough attention. Could you just read the second half of verse five? The second half of verse five. Five. Oh, my Right. Uh, may you be blessed. That's yes. Uh, no. May you be blessed by the Lord because you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Thank you very much. We'll come back to that. I just wanted to hear what your translation said. Oh. Uh, welcome, David and Cynthia. I hope you can hear us okay. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, we can. Sorry, we had a, bit, a, bit, a moment, bit of difficulty please. getting connected. Uh, can you hear us? Yes, yes, we, we can. can. Yes, oh, thank you. we can hear you. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry, we I've got a different setup this time, and uh, it seems to be working. Very good. Uh, Lovely to have you with. Apologies, we were late. We just couldn't get uh, connected. So sorry about that. That's okay. No, no, no worries. It's a, it's a, it's a voluntary activity, so you can come and go, or not come, or come late and leave, leave early. It's entirely up to you. And there's nothing I can do about it. Um, <coughs> um, okay. So uh, David inquired after this, so after Saul's death after David's lament. Where is David at the moment? Ziklag. He's in Ziklag, which is the Philistine city that he was given to his men. He's still there. Uh, And now he's inquiring of the Lord, which, can you remember what inquiring of the Lord means in practice? Praying. No. I was hoping you'd say this, I can say no really quickly. (laughs) It doesn't mean praying. Well, it doesn't. It is a prayer, but it's not simply just get on your knees. Asking after how? Um, and well, 
Urumel Thummim, yes, very good. It's okay. so, yes, you are asking, but how are you expecting the answer? The answer is the Urumel Thummim, which are the, the lots that the high priest has as part of his vestments. Oh. So, this comes from uh, the law of Moses um, from Leviticus numbers. Uh, the part of the vestments of the high priest are the Urim and Mathumim, and you're inquiring, and, and it's never explained. The very fact that they're called Urim and Thumim, which are Hebrew words, we didn't have them translated, that we don't know very much about the details, what they are, but they are consulted. They are referred to several times in the first book of Samuel. And so the very, very high likelihood is that David is asking, he goes to the high priest, um, Abiathar in this case, and the answer comes from the casting of these lots. That's why most of the time the, the questions when, when David inquires of the Lord, somebody inquires of the Lord, they inquire in yes, no answers. Oh. Most of the time. Shall I go or shall I not go? Yes or no. It's, 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 it's a kind of divinely, uh, divinely instituted heads or tails. Heads for yes, tails for no. The Lord said go. <clears throat> in other words, shall I leave Philistia, Philistia and return to Judah. The time has come for him, therefore, to return home. But he doesn't go. It's yet another occasion. He doesn't go until he has inquired of the Lord. He doesn't just calculate, doesn't just make up his own mind. He wants God's will to be done. And the Lord said to him, go up. And David said, to which shall I go up? Now, this isn't a yes or no answer, but obviously there's a list of cities. So, again, we can imagine that the likely process is, shall I go to, uh, no, shall I go to this place? No. Shall I go to Bethlehem? No. I... Hebron, yes. You know, this is a... He said to Hebron. Hebron is still there today, by the way. It's, it's one of the oldest places continuously. It's in the West Bank uh, these days. Imagine that, given the association with David, you can you can imagine why it has been a flashpoint for conflict between uh, Israel Israel and the Palis and Palestinians because it's an important obviously it's in Palestinian territory, but it's got massive significance for Jews. I just said this: the Urim and Thummim, the casting of lots, the lots. You're casting lots. So part of the high something and if it's this way up it's okay and if it's that way up it's not essentially okay, yes right yeah. sorry i just yeah that's okay <laughs> yeah that's that's is it, how it works so david went up and his two wives Ahinoam and abigail of course he had a third wife his first wife michael the son of uh, the daughter of saul but she's been given saul gave him to somebody else kind of as an act of spite against david so she's been remarried to some an, another man. So the two, two remaining wives, Akinom and Abigail, and his men, and all of their households, so their wives and children as well, and the towns of Hebron. Um, you can imagine a small walled town, which is the size of a small village by modern money, in modern money, um, and a thousand people turn up. It's going to be a bit difficult. So they spread themselves to the towns of Hebron. What the towns of Hebron? Basically, the Hebron is the kind of main town and this, the villages, towns of villages surrounding. Uh, it's a little bit like in, in a, on a very small scale of what you have in this country where you might have a city and then country uh, and then market towns surrounding it. Um, this case is like a very small town and then the even smaller towns that are in the area. Yeah, and the men of Judah came, and they and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Now, what's the you know what's the obvious question to ask? Um, they the men of Judah came and they anointed David king over Israel. What's there? There's a there's a sort of this should surprise us a little bit. They were priests then that came and did it. Mm, no. But necessarily need to be, because this wasn't part of the law. The narrative of David up to this point, what's surprising about the men of Judah coming and anointing him king? Sorry, Tapani, what verse are we at? This is verse three. Uh, sorry, verse four. Yeah, okay. 
we got? Mm-hmm. Or chapter two? Yeah. Two verse four. Go on, Carol. Sorry, what? You are going to say something. No? No? Okay, so. <laughs> is, it, is it because he has not sort of um, killing the old... No. Oh, no. Is there anything to the fact that God's not mentioned there? It's the men. Uh, we're really getting warmer. Mentioned. He's already been in on. By Samuel. So what's this business? You know, Samuel anointed him. So what's the, what are these men coming anointing him as king, uh, the men of Judah? And the answer is two things we need to know. First of all, it's the men of Judah. These are not. This is not all the leaders of Israel. These are the the leading men of Judah, his own tribe. So he's becoming king of Judah only. That's the first thing. Ancient people. They're quite old people that claim to do it. Then no not idea. told any about the age. No, anything between twenty and one hundred and twenty. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, we're not told. That's not. That's not a significant thing. The significant thing is that they are the leading men. They are the ones who get to. You know, they're the kind of leaders of the clan of Judah. Mm-hmm. And the other thing to say is that, of course, there is. There are two stages to this. Just like Samuel anointed Saul king, and then Israel proclaimed him king. So there's the private anointing, and then there's the public acclamation. So there's no conflict. They are, they are acknowledging him as king who was anointed king by Samuel in private. So they are receiving him who has already been chosen. There are all sorts of parallels in, in the Christian church with this. So, for example, uh, there's when, when pastors are called, you know, when people are ordained into the ministry, there's often talk of the twofold call. There's an inner call, which the person experiences, that, you know, the, the, where for what, however that works, they... they they choose to put themselves forward, if you like, uh, for ordination. And then there's the outer call, the external call, the church says, we want you to be the pastor, we want you to be a pastor. And if somebody has an inner call, but the church doesn't call them, tough. Somebody, if the church calls them and they said, I don't feel called by God, I don't think that's right, and they decline it, that also is tough. And so there's the, the, the private and the public, they need to be in harmony with each other. David being anointed by Samuel, in front of his brothers and his father, and the rest of Israel saying we're not interested, means that David will never be. There's also a slightly further, at further remove, uh, there is a right that isn't given in the Bible, but is the church's uh, ec- um, practice uh, for a very long time, which is in cases of emergency baptism. So, for example, if a child is born very, very poorly, or at great risk of death, there's an emergency baptism done there and then, Mm-hmm. in that private setting so when that child is in if the child survives and is well and is then brought to the church there's often a a, a, a simple short rite where the church publicly acknowledge, acknowledges the baptism that has already been administered so it's not the child is not baptized again but they say essentially there's sort of a way of saying we we recognize your baptism we recognize and we now if you like publicly receive you as a baptized member of the church it's a similar so it's, it's not the same thing obviously there's a similar sort of thing private and public and these two things must they both must be in place always in the same this is why the church for example is always uh, opposed uh, secret marriages elopements you know where 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 you know boy and a girl run away and then they kind of get married without public matter. No, it's not only a private matter, it's also a public matter. Even today, to this day, you cannot get married in the, legally in this country. The sun must be up oh, yeah. during the wedding. Yeah, yeah. So you can't get married at night. Oh. And that's, that's an, ancient, it's an ancient law that goes back, is, is to prevent secret marriages. Oh. And it's, not, it's never been struck off. So, so if you want to get married at midnight because you'd be cute, sorry, you can't. It's not legal. No, you have to. The sun must be up uh, during the wedding, during the actual marriage. There you go. Stuff you learn. Um, so that's the city. So now David has become the king of Judah, which also means, what does it tell us about Israel? <laughs> if David is king of Judah, what does it tell us about the the, the kingdom of Israel. Separate. It's divided, yes. It's not currently acting in unison. 
And things are about to get worse, mm. which we'll find out in a minute. But so and then <coughs> David hears of the fact that the men of Jabesh Gilead buried Saul, because remember, he saved them. Uh, he had saved them from extinction, uh, Saul had. And so to show him, show him reverence, the men of Jab Jabesh Gilead is if, uh, it's just on the other side of the Jordan. So David does something just like we had in the previous chapter. He does something that's both honorable and expedient. It's the right thing to do. It's a good thing to do, but it also happens to serve his own interests as the right thing, of, you know, doing the right thing very often does. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, and this is why I wanted you to read, read your translation, because the ESV, which um, uh, Rosemary, you and I have as well, yeah. um, the, J, the ESV, RSV, uh, various, these, these family of translations, they claim that they want to, or they, their, self, their kind of aim is to try and render the Bible as literally as possible without making it gibberish in English so that we, we come as close as possible to understanding what the Bible says. And it does it very well often and, can, and spectacularly fails here, both the RFG and the ESV. Because it says, may you be blessed by the Lord, so far so good, by Yahweh, because you, and they said, you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. Now, Barbara, I'm almost certain that your Bible says in verse 5, the Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul. In verse 5. Verse 5. To say uh, kindness. May the Lord now show you kindness. Yeah, kindness. Yeah, kindness. exactly. So, the, and the word that is translated here as loyalty, if, if that's what your Bible says, mm. is the word, if you want, this is one of these wonderfully, wonderful Sunday Hebrew words, chesed. Uh, and, it's, uh, and what it means is the word that is tra often translated as loving kindness or some such phrase. Um, if, in older translations, it used to be translated as mercy, like in, like in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all. It doesn't mean mercy in the sense of you letting a sin, sinner off or you're letting a criminal off and you, instead of punishing them justly, you, give, you, you uh, acquit. That's what that word means. It means kindness, goodness, and if like uh, uh, an attitude and action emanating from love and goodwill. It's the sort of thing that in the Bible talks is often in this or in the New Testament is often try, uh, um, called love, like love your neighbor as yourself. Love, like First Corinthians thirteen, love is you know love is gentle, love is patient, love is kind, and so on. Because it's the idea, it, it, it's the the that the word is agape, which you might have come across sometimes agape, which is that where you act according to your own goodness in view of the need. Of your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So you give to them what they need from what you have. And it, it doesn't, it's not about mercy, it's not about um, it's not about fault, you know, uh, overlooking faults, but rather uh, this attitude of wanting to do good because of your own love or your own kindness and goodness. Now, this is the word that David attributes to the men of Jabesh Gilead, not loyalty. Loyalty is a kind of interpretation. Usually at the NIV, which Barbara, you have, interprets it into the kind of appropriate phrase. The ESV, RSV usually try to stick with the original word. Yeah, the roles have been reversed. Um, you showed this loving kindness to Saul, your Lord, and buried him. There's no mercy, obviously, involved. Their soul is dead, but they acted out of goodness, kindness, love, uh, and so on, uh, toward. Verse 6, it says, Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. Now steadfast love is exactly the same word. You showed steadfast love to Saul. Now may the Lord show steadfast love to you. And if you translate as loyalty, and it, you miss the connection, the whole point. May the Lord show you the same thing that you showed to Saul. This is exactly what we have in the beginning of 1 Samuel, when we say, you know, you know the Lord uh, honours those who honour him. 
And there is this, and we think often, you know, you know, there's nothing good we can do. We're all sinners and it's all bad and but God is good. But actually, you know, God, we, we, the scripture teaches consistently forgiveness of sins is an act of, of unmerited grace and mercy on God's well, We think kingdom of God where those who are within the kingdom of God are those who are forgiven sinners. The forgiveness is already dealt with. Now, what, what's left? Now we are called to live, you know, let, uh, you let your light shine so that people may see your good works and praise God. Uh, <clears throat> love your neighbor as yourself. Outdo one another in showing honor. All these commands of scripture has for those who are already forgiven to live in a manner worthy of our calling. Scripture also then says, and God, who is faithful and who is just and righteous and remembers his own word, will also then reward us. Knowledge what we have done. And this is not an, this should never be a cause of anxiety. You know, oh no, I haven't done as many good works as Bob down the road. So I will be rewarded less. It's rather it's it's all on top of the grace, mercy, and love and riches of God's kingdom we already have. God says, and I will also acknowledge what you have done. Like Jesus says, you know, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites standing in the marketplaces. They have received their reward. Instead, go pray in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now Jesus says that our prayers will be rewarded. It doesn't mean you get to heaven if you pray enough or well enough. It means you're going to heaven and when you pray, the father will re- your heavenly father will reward your prayers. In other words, he will answer them. When you give alms, don't just hypocrites kind of ringing their bells and look, everybody, I'm giving alms, blow the trumpet. No, let, don't let your right, left hand know what your right hand is doing. Father will reward you. You can, have, you can get your rewards from men, or you can get your rewards from the Heavenly Father. Those are the choices. If you get your rewards from men, that's it. Of no lasting value. Or you can get your rewards from the Heavenly Father, and that's it. You will, for, for, until all eternity, acknowledge say those words that Jesus uses in the name. Well done, you good and faithful sir. Thank you for doing what I asked you to do. I could have done it better myself, but I thank you for doing what you did. That's all. And I think that's very important because it encar- it's an encouragement to us. Just like the doctrine of election, which we're not going to talk about today, but people often say the doctrine of election, you know, predestination, those things pe- make, can make you very anxious because they say, well, <laughs> if there's predestination, has God elected me? Am I predestined to this or to that? And it's turned into this doctrine that for a lot of Christian causes them to wonder about God's grace. But in the New Testament, there is a doctrine of election and predestination, which has been given to encourage Christians. Your salvation isn't, a, isn't something that blew, blew in on in the wind this morning. It was decided before the foundation of the world. Thanks be to God. Likewise, the doctrine about good works. It's not, you know, here's your, here's your tally. Here's your quota. Once you fill it up, God will be gracious. No. Everything that you need to receive God's good, goodwill and favor has been accomplished by Jesus. You've received it in full, everything. Everything's there. Now, here are all these good works for you to do. And when you do them, God will be pleased and will reward you. You show loving kindness, he will show loving kindness. With the measure you measure, he will measure to you. If you're stingy in your good works, the rewards for this will be stingy too. But that's not a salvation, not salvation. It's, you, it's a, an acknowledgement of what you have or haven't done. Oh, you are wonderful people. You are perfect. But You're holy and righteous. Jesus. Yes, that's what I just said. Yes, that's right. But go. All this, I, I didn't know. I didn't say that. I, I didn't say that. It feels like that your feeling is wrong. Okay. I just said your salvation is entirely and complete entirely complete so but some, what what it is but what you're supposed to do with the rest of it like now that you're saved you go, well i don't need to do anything for my salvation so i can now just sit on the sofa watch daytime tv and drink beer until jesus comes back because you know there's nothing left to do so no the world is full of need and you have been called to do good in this world and when you do god will say thank you just like you know if i send a young child on an errand which i could do better and be- and more quickly uh, than the child could, they go and do it, not very well, 
not very swiftly, very inefficiently, and they come back and say, thank you, because they did what I asked them to do. And I'm not going to say, you know, you're not my son yet, because you just don't chop wood as well as I would and as fast as you. No, you're my son, but I asked you to do this. You've done it badly. You did it as well as you could. You did it to the best of your ability. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Here's your pocket money or whatever it is. And it's the same sort of thing. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about what the saved to do, what the, those who are already righteous, how they live their lives. And we must learn to keep those both in our minds and never let them. Our salvation is like being born. So about good works is what we do after we're born. We're already alive. It's going to say, you know what? We're just going to shove you back in your mother. It's, it's, if you think of it in those terms, it should be very, very simple. Where it gets complicated is when we start measuring ourselves. Or saying, since we don't measure ourselves, nothing else matters. To say that nothing but salvation matters is like saying nothing matters except being born. Well, it's, that's just not true. Once you're born, you still need to eat and drink. And then if you just lie in, on, on your bed for the rest of your life saying, well, it doesn't really matter what I do because I'm already alive, you will end up wasting your life. You know, and, 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 and you have a poor and, 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 a poor, a poor and, and uh, unfulfilled life. In the same way that if you're a Christian, you waste the opportunities that God gives you. It doesn't make you not a Christian, but you miss out on all the wonderful extra riches that are there to enrich your Christian life even further. All the, you know, the cherries on the cake. Cake's still there. Jesus baked that. Let's move on. But I just want to do, I want to spend a little bit of time on that just to see that it's, it's a very common theme. You show steadfast love, may the Lord show you steadfast. And that's why the mistranslation of it is unhealthy. That makes sense so far. Yeah. And then David goes on to say, you know, may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. So he implies their faithfulness and he wishes God's faithfulness upon them. And he says, I will do good to you because you have done this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the NIV translates, I, will, I, will, I too will show you the same favor. The word is literally goodness. So he's implying you have been good. May God be good to you, and I pledge myself, my goodness to you as well. In other words, he wishes God to reward them, and he promises to reward them too. Because you have done this, my, my, um, I, I will be benevolent towards you. They, they, again, their faithfulness is being rewarded both divinely and royally, literally. Not royally. And verse 7 let your hands be strong, be valiant, for saw your Lord is dead, and the house of Judah has known to me king over them. What's he saying? Well, not to be worried about anything. He's, he is now, I don't want to say in charge of them, but we'll take care of them. Yes, but he's also therefore implying, he's, he's essentially appealing that they acknowledge his authority because it's only the house of Judah. Saul is from the house of Benjamin, who's king of Israel, not of Judah. And there's already a kind of there's this sort of, a gap has grown between Judah and the rest of Israel. So he's essentially he's extending his protection over them if they will take it. He has to persuade them because, of course, Saul portrayed David as an enemy. These people are exceptionally loyal to Saul. So David has some work to do to, to encourage and believe that he too, that he, do, he does not regard Saul as having been an enemy. He blesses them for the loyalty they have shown to Saul. And therefore he's, he's saying, to be good to Saul is what I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on that side. I'm on the side of those who are good to Saul. I'm not an enemy of Saul. Which is why I said that he does the right thing, which happens also to be expedient to him. So that's the first section. We've now got David. You know, David is king of Judah, and he kind of tidies up, if you like, the loose end uh, um, in the death and, and the fallout. Uh, 
And I said already, this is the beginning of the division, or this is the, when the kingdom becomes divided, because not only is David only king of Judah at this point, but now we see that there's a, uh, a rival. Um, Rosemary, would you mind reading verses 8 to 11? <laughs> but son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbotheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead. And the Arthurites and Jezreel, and Ephraim and Benjamin, and all of Israel. Ishboeth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned for two years, but the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Okay, now before we look at the details of what actually happened, some comments on the names here. I don't, no, 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 no not, not on the pronunciation, on the meanings. Okay, so uh, the son of Saul is called here Ishbosheth. Now he's the fourth son of Saul. And we are told a little bit later on, uh, so we're told here that he was 40 years old when he began to reign, which suggests that he was born around the time that Saul became king. So he's, by some distance, the youngest son of uh, Saul. And unlike his three older brothers, he, what, he survived the battle with the Philistines. How he... Name is given as ish which means man of shame. He is, we're told in, in Chronicles, which is a much, much later writing, but which covers the same history as uh, books of Samuel and King, King, the Kings, uh, or se second Samuel onwards, that his, his name was Eshbal, not Ishbosheth, Eshbal, which either means a uh, fire of Baal, maybe somebody who's in a Baal, Baal being. Baal is actually a word that just means Lord, but it is, it becomes in the Old Testament, it becomes a generic word for the, the, the Canaanite kind of chief god. Mm. What, a, what, a, what a Zeus was to Greeks and Jupiter to the Romans, Baal was to the various Canaanite uh, uh, people. And so he'd be, he's like a, a fire of Baal, one who kind of, fire of Baal, if you like, or it could just mean man of Baal. Now, when Eshbal became Ishbosheth, we don't know, but we only have the ancient versions. So the both the Greek and Hebrew versions of the text only ever refer to Ishbosheth in the Old Testament, in, in the book of uh, Second Book of Samuel. He's never called Eshbal. Chronicles refers to him as Eshbal. Now, it's very unlikely that his actual name given by his parents was Ishbosheth, man of shame. Very unlikely. There's also a very high likelihood, and we know that this happened, uh, if you compare the text, that later or later, if you like copies of the scripture, they, because of the association with Baal and Baal being associated with idolatry, especially after the time of Elijah, that any names of people who are supposed to be good Israelites, who, who had Baal in them, was you know, that, that was an embarrassment. Because he made them sound like they were idolaters when they were. Mm. And so the, we don't know when it's happened, but at some point, Eshbal was no longer referred to as Eshbal, but Ishbosheth. There were some other names, other people who, who have also Baal in their name to whom the same thing happened. When it happened, we don't know. Was the original version of the book of Samuel, did he say Ishbosheth, and the later copies changed it? We don't know because we have very, very few ancient copies. Of the text, we only have things that you know copies that were copied are much, 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 much later than the writing. So it's possible, for example, as one one uh, one book suggests, that what happened was that, was that when the books of Samuel were, were written, he was called Ishbosheth. Then, when at some point the you know somebody copied copied you know people had copied versions where they changed it to Ish, uh, Esh, sorry, it was called, it was called Eshbal. Later copies. Uh, Referred to him as Ishbosheth, and the earlier copies haven't, haven't survived, and the later copies have. That's a possibility. One thing. So, when you, if you're reading uh, the books of Chronicles, Amen.
The other thing to say is that he refers to the, in verse 9, he talks about King of Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel. Asherites really means Assyrians. Not likely. <laughs> it's far more likely that this is a, 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 a kind of a misspelling or miscopying, perhaps, of the people of Asher, which is one of the tribes of Israel. So much more like to be Asherites than, than it is to be Ashurites. But the only copies of the Hebrew text we have, they all say Ashurites. The Greek translation of the Septuagint, which is old, older than the surviving Hebrew text, is even more wrong. <laughs> uh, so there's, it's, there's a kind of, the text of 1 and 2 Samuel is notoriously difficult in some places. At the same time, good to remember, I don't really know what's been said. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing significant hangs on it, but that's the reason why, why it's there. I just, uh, you know, it might be a bit more information than you desire, but I just thought I'd just point that out <coughs> that these are, there are these sort of uncertainties. Mahanaim, so Abne is, the, is a commander of Saul's army. He's, he's either Saul's uncle or his cousin. Yeah. Um, and makes him king. I, Abner's clearly in charge here, and we will see in the rest of the chapter that Abner's, what, what happens to Abner is, is more significant in a sense. Ishbosheth is a, is a weak character who is making his son of Saul. Now we know that this isn't the right thing to do because God has chosen David, but uh, Abner's clearly not convinced at this point. Um, he takes the son of Saul. He wants to, he wants to keep Saul's line going and again he's a he's a he's a kinsman so it's in his interests to do that anyway and he clearly got the it's we get the impression that the army of Saul remains loyal to Abner even after this point and so he brings him over to Mahanaim Mahanaim is just across the Jordan on the eastern side of the Jordan and it's a significant place apparently I'm told I haven't been there but I'm told that it's sort of it's a good place to have as headquarters in terms of defensive position. But also significant because that's the place. Remember when, Dave, when Jacob returns from serving Laban and returns to the promised land, and then he's just before he meets his brother Esau after all these years, he stays in Mahanaim overnight and angels appear to him. So it's a place kind of of historic significance uh, as well. This is in Genesis uh, chapter... Uh, 32. But he, he, so that's where it happens. And we're told he's 40 years old. Now, look at the, <coughs> there's another surprise here. Ishbosheth was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned for two years. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now, who else was king of Israel in that time? They haven't said, have they? Next king of Israel after Ishbosheth. Well, it is David. Mm. So, how do we account for the five and a half years? Uh, sorry, um, yeah, five and a half years. Oh. Ishbosheth king for two years, David for seven and a half years, and the king after Saul is Ishbosheth, and the king after Ishbosheth is David. Two and a half years, which the account doesn't, because we go flow quite neatly from one to the next to the next. There's no kind of, in these five and a half years, there was no king. Or that this is what happened. Do you think that they may have made David their king, but not... Um... No. No, that's not the case. The Six short... months is unusual, isn't it? Why specifically? Because that's how long it was. Oh. If they didn't have a leader during that time. Question. Um, we don't have an absolutely definite answer to this, but we know some things that help us to reconstruct what happened. Remember what the Philistines did after they defeated Saul and, and uh, disgraced his body and, and so on.
Come back home to you, eh? They occupied the land. Yes. They occupied the land and they took over the cities, many of the towns of Israel. Now, there is no suggestion of any Philistine presence in the coming chapters, which suggests that at some point the Philistines have been expelled again and Israel is again free. Because when the Philistines came, they occupied the land, there would be no king of Israel because the Philistines have, 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 have conquered them. And they've occupied. At some point, the occupation has ended such that they can have the, a king of their own again. So the suggestion, which we can't ascertain for absolute certainty, but is quite likely, is that it took five. You know, that there's a gap, if you like, between verse seven and verse eight of five and a half years, in which time the Israelites, either the Philistines, decide to go home. Or under Abner's leadership, the Israelites managed to win back their cities and a, a, a campaign that is not recorded for us. And so the two years are the last two years of the seven and a half year period. It's the most likely thing. The reason I spend time on this again is, is that when you're reading this, you hang on, hang on, what, what's going on? Here? There's a it seems, seeming contradiction. That's the likely reason. I don't know if that's something you want to comment on or ask about. But I just thought I'd point it out. I suppose when they were writing this <coughs> up, they didn't want to. Um... Billy Stone, yeah. Yes, so he, he she, but he. it was he, um, sort of, they kicked him out or not, but the, the thing in that area was. I think it's more likely it's just that they, they are focusing on the really salient points of the story. So there's lots of detail that just they just think it's not important enough for this story to be included. I think that's the most likely explanation. That they just, you know, they, they, there's a kind of quite a narrow focus on because this is now the first time where we have two kings at once. We have a king of Israel and a king of Judah. Judah is standing alone with their own king, separate from the other tribes of Israel. It's significant, uh, quite important. Uh, in, it's interesting at the very least that much later on, when the kingdom divided, not much later on, but some, some decades on after Solomon's death, the kingdom, the kingdom divides again into Judah and Israel. That at the second division, which then becomes permanent for the next several centuries, one kingdom, and the other other tribes form the rest of the kingdom. So Judah, tribes of David and of Saul, yeah. become joined permanently, which is why Benjamin and Judah are the only tribes that survive the exile, the first exile. So, for example, uh, Saul, who becomes Paul, the apostle. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, but he, he would call himself a Jew, which really just means Judean. So, you know, there's an awful lot happens in two generations to forge a, a strong bond between Judah and Benjamin, the tribes of Saul and David. On this, but if you think about how this reflects on, you know, if you think of what do we learn about Jesus here? Always the question we need to ask ourselves, what do we learn about Jesus is that the, the two tribes that should be strongest enemies, owing to the wisdom and, and righteousness, if you like, of the king of Judah, David, enemies become friends. And they become inseparable. And isn't this one here? God, you know, Paul says of Jesus in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God so loved the world. God acted, Jesus came to make friends out of enemies. And we see this with David in this, you know, not in this particular moment, but in that, in that longer story. Any thoughts? First uh, 11 verses. A lot of, lot of history and detail, though. Mm -hmm. 
Rounding silence. So we shall, in that case, what I like to do is to read the rest <coughs> of the chapter. <coughs> and uh, it's quite a long bit, but it really just describes one, one set of events. Uh, so um, ask um, David and Cynthia, would you mind reading? And if we, um, if we do a paragraph, paragraph each, if, if, if David and Cynthia, if you, uh, one of you starts and the other one, and then we go back to Carol mm -hmm. and then uh, finish with uh, Rosemary, starting in verse 12. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Down, down to which verse, Tapani, sorry. <clears throat> 17, then 80 okay. to 23, 24 to 28, and then 20. Okay, thank you. Now Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeriah, <clears throat> and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. So they sat down, one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. Then Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So they arose and went over by number, 12 from Benjamin, followers of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 from the servants of David. And each one grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side. <clears throat> so they fell down together. Therefore, swords which is in Gibeon <clears throat> so there was a very fierce battle that day and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David now the three sons of Zeriah were there Joab, Abishai and Ashahel and Ashahel was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle so Ashahel pursued Abner and in going, he did not turn to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Are you Ashiel? He answered, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and lay hold on one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. But Ashiel would not turn aside from following him. So Abner said again to Ashiel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother Joab? However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear, so that the spear came out of his back, and he fell down there and died on the spot. So it was that as many as came to the place where Ashiel fell and died, stood still. To what verse happening? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner, and as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amor, which lies before Gihar, on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the Benjamites gathered themselves together behind Abner, and became one band, and took their stand on the top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you bid your people turn from the pursuit of their brethren? <coughs> Joab said, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would have given up the pursuit of their brethren in the morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the men stopped and pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight any more. And Abner and his men went all the night through to Abba. They crossed the Jordan, and marching the whole morning, they came to Mahanama. Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, they were missing from David's servants, 19 men besides Ashel. But the servants of David had struck down at Benjamin 360 of Abner's men, and they took up Asherel and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. And Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. Thank you. Okay, not a very uh, pleasant story. Um, anybody? Sorry? Who's Zeruiah? Joab and Abner and Azael are sons of Zeruiah. 
Don't worry, I have to look it up too. Uh, Zaria was David's sister. Oh. So these are these are David's nephews, these three. Almost certainly uh, Zaria was a, an older sister to David, not a yeah. younger sister. David was, is, is referred to as the youngest. Seven brothers and three sisters, if I remember correctly. Um, and so you have now you have these two king, two rival kings. You've got David and, and you've got Ishbosheth, and you can see Abnes doing all the work. Ishbosheth is nowhere to be found. It's, it's Abnes clearly sort of running the place, but Ishbosheth is, is the is enthroned. And um, they come to this uh, pool of Gibeon, uh, which is still there, by the way. There is a, there's a natural pool there. And um, you've got the, on either side of it. So they What's this? What's this game? Who can win? Yeah. <laughs> so there, it's like, yeah, it's like a proxy. So yes. Instead of having a massive yeah. battle, so they can, let's have let's have some choice men from each side, and whoever wins wins. Yeah. Um, and they choose twelve from each side. Uh, which may or may not be symbolic of you know one for each of the tribes. Yeah. <coughs> Benjamin and Ishbosheth and twelve of the seven states. So you can see Ishbosheth is king of Israel, but it really is the men of Benjamin. It's Benjamin v Judah, really. Is Benjamin going to be supreme over Israel, or is Judah going to be? And whoever wins is the whole kingdom. So Ephraim, which becomes the dominant tribe later on, is nowhere to be found, for example. Uh, this is a, a, whether this is a kind of literal description of exactly what happened or whether there's a sort of shorthand for... Basically, it was a very bloody dead heat. Everybody killed everybody. No, there were no survivors. Base was called Helkath Hazarim, which your footnote will tell you means something like the place of the sword edge or times or something like that. It's the place where, you know, it became a place that was remembered for the fact that the swords were crossed. 24 died, 12. Battle. 12 from each side. And they? And they killed each other. Yeah. Be one left standing. No, because they killed each other. Well, that's how they say, you know, they grabbed each other by head yeah. and went like, and, and, and as you can see, they, they kind of, it was a bit like, uh, you it wasn't know. wasn't a fight then. No, no, it was a battle. That's okay. what I just said. So what they did was they, they uh, you know, they, they killed each other simultaneously, as it were. Mm. We don't know. That's all we know is what was told here. It's, it's a bit like if you imagine like a, like a, oh, it's a wild west gunfight where you know both both men draw the gun at the same or, or a duel and they both draw at the same time and, and both both kill each other. Uh, and so because this didn't this didn't resolve the matter, a full battle yeah. full battle ensued uh, in which <coughs> defeated by the men by by Joab's troops. And then we're told about the sons of Zeruiah, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. And Asahel was as swift of foot as a wild gazelle. What's the fastest animal in the world? Depends. Land or sea? Or be. air? Um, Peregrine falcon, I think, is the fastest in dive, when he dives. And swordfish are pretty fast. And then long distance or short distance. So if you want to sprint, you want to, your, your money's on the cheetah. But if you go anything more than a a half a mile you want. Keep going at 30 miles an hour for a very long time. And they frequently outrun cheetah if they get a bit of a head start. Spiritual significance, but as somebody who's living in the plains of Africa, uh, mm -hmm. something that interests me. Sahel being fast, he started chasing Abner. Now see what the Abner says. Abner basically gives him every opportunity to change his mind. You know, don't come after me. You might think, well, is he a coward? Is he is he trying to save his life? But actually, he he's he's so confident. He 
He said, please don't pursue me because I will like, how will I stand next to your brother? You know, uh, how will I explain myself to your brother? He's so confident that he will, if they fight, he will win. And I say, I will die. So, you know, pick on somebody smaller. As a hell, young man, as he is, doesn't listen. And when they one blow, how do you kill somebody? How do you thrust the butt end of a spear through somebody? One suggestion is that maybe they had some sort of sharp point as well, launched to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a pretty gr gruesome end to a very, you know, it's a short, short, short fight and it ends terribly. And now Azael is dead. And of course, that means that Joab and Abishai, the surviving brothers, now have a very serious grudge against Abner, even though we know that Abner was trying to avoid this. I was, you know, I, if he didn't fight, he would be killed. Mm -hmm. And the Joab, as the pursuit continues until they come to this hill of Ammon. Yeah, in, in the region of the wilderness of Gibeon. At this point, verse 20, we're already in verse 25, that Benjamin, Benjamin are able to read being, but they are they are uh, they are now on this on the top of a hill, which means that if they carry on, there will be another battle and a lot of people will die. Yeah. And Abner, we get a some of the sense of the character of Abner in this chapter, and it's important for what happens in the next chapter, is that. Abner, though he's an, you know, he's at the moment he's he's a, a, an adversary to Job's army. He's already tried to avoid having to kill yeah. as a hell. Now he's trying to avoid blood, further bloodshed. And he says what everybody should have thought. This is a this is a this is brothers killing brothers. And this puts us in mind should put us in mind uh, of um, something that had already happened. Uh, early in the history of Israel, uh, in the book of Judges, uh, uh, in the book of Judges, there there uh, was also a um, a civil war in which the tribe of Benjamin was very nearly wiped out. That's how we, that's how Judges ends. They get uh, they get slaughtered. <coughs> And so this is clearly, this is an important part of the memory. And Abner, who is a man of Benjamin, is trying to avoid repeating that. Joab listens to him. Stop pursuing, and the fight stops. Abner and his men, they, they went all the night through the Arabah, which is the valley of the Jordan. They crossed the They have time, you can tell about the distance, relative distances, Joab has time to bury his brother and get home in the same time that um, Abner and his men return to their base. Buried in Bethlehem, because again, as, as I said, the Ruah is David's sister, so they clearly he's, he's, yeah, they, they, he's from there, sort of the same region as David. They are David's kinsmen, mm -hmm. the, the soldiers. Um, and then if you just look at verse one of the next chapter, which really is part of our study as well. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul. Or if I may borrow a phrase from the New Testament, one increased and the other one decreased. Said that that would be what was Jesus and um, John the Baptist. Yes, John the Baptist <laughs> said of himself, <laughs> you know, he must seen. increase, I must yeah. decrease, yeah. and he did that voluntarily. Uh, Saul, when he came to David, Ishbosheth did it involuntarily, yeah. he fought against God's will, yeah. and he wouldn't, he didn't go well. So we're not told anything more about what happened in that war, only that we, there were more battles to come and there weren't. 
It's only 20 to 3. We've only been going for an hour. It brings us to the end of this whole section of the chapter. So now <clears throat> we're not going to start on chapter 3 because there's a there's a there's quite a lot of there's there's too much there for us to cover it mm -hmm. in the remaining time. So this gives us an opportunity, maybe if, if you've got any thoughts about this or <laughs> or this passage or what we discussed today <laughs> for us to pursue or to kind of explore it uh, in more detail. This is the sometimes the slightly longer chapters are quick to do because they are so uh, so much just narrative. So over to you. Question, thoughts, comments. Anything that we've covered. Uh, we've sort of There's an awful about. lot of war and killing and with not much resolved really. No, no. At the end of the day. And again, it's, if you do you remember what it, one of the accounts of uh, Paul's or Saul's conversion in the Book of Acts, there's several accounts of it, and in one of them, I think the last one, when when Saul is recounting his own um, his his conversion uh, to the Herod Antipas, the king, um, he says that the Jesus, when he says uh, Jesus, when he speaks to Saul on the road to Damascus, he says to him. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And what's a goad? It, um, a goad is uh, basically, it usually it's just it's a sharpened stick, you know, something with a sharp point. And when you're driving a, a team of oxen, for example, it, with horses, you use, a horse, you, yeah. with a horse, you use reins. Yes. With oxen, you use a goad. So if they, if they try to turn one way or another, you're behind it, you just poke them with a sharp stick. Mm. And very quickly, they stop trying to turn that way. Mm. Jesus says to Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. Mm. I, 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 have, I, have, I have determined where you shall go. And if you try to fight against it, it's just going to hurt you. Mm. So it's a quite, a quite a useful image, I think, for all kinds of things, but particularly when we think of God doing his work. If God has decided this is what's going to happen, the sooner we figure out what God's will is and align our will with it, the easier for us. Yeah. And here we see, here's an example where the damage that comes when there are men who will not accept God's will. Even Saul himself knew that, you know, acknowledged before his death that David shall become king, and yet they try desperately to fight against the Ishbra, Abner with Ishbra, so they try to avoid the inevitable. And it's very, very hard. And, and lots of people suffer in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe, you know, David's men lost 20 altogether. The other side lost 360. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that they've got precise numbers, really, isn't it? Well, they, they're not, yeah, it's... Um, or are they yeah. just thereabouts? I think 19 is, is likely, it's not likely 18.7 or 19.3, so... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One plus nineteen. Is they are they are. I mean, it might be three hundred fifty nine and three sixty one, but you know, but the the if you think of the proportions, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's an enormous loss. Twenty three sixty as opposed to twenty. And it's not it's not a huge number in a, in any given battle by modern standards, but if this sort of thing goes on, given the size of the population, mm -hmm. but it's this whole thing of you know God's will. We have a hymn in the hymnal. Uh, what God ordains is always good. Yeah. The, the, the German original says, uh, was Gott tut, das ist a Volgen. And what God does is always done well. Mm. The, you know, when, we, when we know what God's will is, we know that, okay, this is, this is going to be the best way. It's not just that God is boss and we have to do as you're told, you know, like you sometimes at work. You know, the boss makes decisions and they might be the wrong things, you know, but you just have to go on with it because the boss is boss. God, he doesn't act out of arbitrary. I just happen to do it because I happen to do it. And this is a long medieval debate amongst philosophers, based, which goes all the way back actually to ancient Greece. This is do things become, you know, are things good or bad because God commands them? Or does God command things because they're good or bad? I, is murder only bad because God said you shouldn't do it? Or did God say you shouldn't do it because murder is bad? 
Is you can see the dilemma. And the correct answer is that the, those are both really bad options. <coughs> because if God only prohibits murder, if murder is only bad because God says so, right, if God told us to murder each other and that you become good, that means that God is completely arbitrary mm -hmm. and he doesn't seem to care about what actually what the consequences of his command. On the other hand, if we say, oh, God only commands, God prohibits murder because he knows that it's bad, that means God is actually subject to a higher, some kind of a higher authority or standard. He has to do as he's told. There's a thing that says murder is bad, and God knows, oh, I know that murder is bad. So he, and, and God isn't, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That there's like a law that God must obey. But of course, both of those options are, are, are wrong. And what, the, what they both ignore is that God acts out of his own nature. And what is the nature of God? The nature of God is love, which is loving kindness, steadfast, benevolence. If you like, God in his wisdom knows what is good for us, what will, what will be to our benefit, what will, uh, what will serve us well. And then he gives his law, which promotes that. that well, where everybody said all the Ten Commandments. There wouldn't be a war in Ukraine. There wouldn't be a famine because, because of, of some people hoarding uh, or, or, or failing to. We wouldn't have schisms in the church because everybody would always do the right thing. Imagine the world where everybody kept the Ten Commandments. What, a, what, a, what sort of place would it be? You wouldn't need speed. God knows what is good for us. And he commands, he does things for our good. Romans um, chapter 8, we're told that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Paul is writing to the Romans specifically in that chapter about suffering. Mm -hmm. All things work together. and our sorrows and our losses and our fears and our, you know, all, all things that come our way, not just the nice things, work together for our good. Because we love God and therefore we know that God is for us and not, and, and, and not against us. Conversely, therefore, if you try to get yourself in the way of God's will and our purpose is God's will, like Ishbosheth and Abner were, always ultimately be, be, be defeated, even if it seems that for a while you're successful. Um, sooner or later, God's justice will catch up with you. You know, when you say, if you're, if you're going to be a liar, you need to have a really good memory. Yeah. And <clears throat> eventually, if you live by the theft, and dishonesty eventually will catch up with you sooner or later. And even if you manage to get your grave unscathed, mm -hmm. you will have to face God's justice eventually. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we always do better to ignore every other offer on the table and do God's will, even if it comes at a short-term cost. That's, if you like, the big, big picture behind this. And if you, if you again think of Don't just think of some, you know, come uh, distant, powerful, celestial authority. So when he says, God wants you to say, Jesus wants you. To. What did Jesus ever do for me that I should trust him? Well, where do I start? God, God gives you suffering. It's Jesus who gives you suffering. When God allows you to be mocked or persecuted. Or when God says, I want you to ignore what you want and do the thing. Or... You can say, well, that's what Jesus wants for me. And this is a Jesus who was on the cross, who died for me, who gave himself up for me, who suffered for me, when he deserved his wrath and punishment. And that's the great comfort of the gospel. There is no God 
we know no other God except the one who makes himself known to us and who encounters us in Jesus Christ. God was doing his will. He was doing his will for Israel. David, his anointed one. He called him. He chose him. He prepared him. He equipped him. This, that was to resist what was best for him. What was best. So that's the sermon I would preach in this text, maybe today. <laughs> Rick, you're very, very silent. Even David isn't saying anything. That's quite remarkable. The, we, um, so we're just having a slight problem with the audio. Um, <laughs> what was it you say? It's been erratic. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. No, no, it's not your fault. It's just technology. Um, we seem to be losing about a quarter of every conversation. So that's so we haven't been able to quite get into all the different conversations. That's a shame because we, we can hear you perfectly. Yeah. So. It was yeah. a little bit like that last night in Compine, though, wasn't it? Was it? I don't yes. know. Yes. Oh, it, was crystal, yeah. it was crystal clear all the time. On okay, the so I think it's, yeah. Went so, a bit in and out on but, the well, it, it's all being recorded. Yeah. yeah. And you will find it on the church website. Yeah. So if you want to go back and listen to it, you know, while you're lying asleep in bed or something, then it's, it's all I, there. I, I think it's the Irish Sea border. It's the protocol. <laughs> <laughs> it must be. I must be. Yeah. We'll, we'll call Danny Street and ask them to fix this. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Well, let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made known your will to us in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have commanded us to pray that your will be done, and therefore we can be confident that it will also be done in our lives. And we pray that you would always show it to us clearly and that you would uh, give us daily repentance and growing trust in you that we would gladly follow wherever you lead. We thank you for all the good gifts with which you surround your children. We thank you also that our sufferings and our deprivations and, and all the hardships of life likewise work for the furtherance of your goodwill towards us, that all things work together for our benefit. Help us always entrust ourselves to you. And we pray that this hope and this comfort would spread far and wide to those who still live without uh, the knowledge. Your kingdom would continue to extend, that no one would perish for want of here. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. 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 Amen.